Welcome to Dr. Bill Waddell's Bible study mini series entitled, Engaging in Active Christianity. Today we are studying lesson two of how to share your faith. You're going to, we, we printed out the notes from last week. We just didn't have them ready last week. Uh, the notes from last week are on the table in the back, the table in the hall. There's a little table here in the foyer that has uh, the notes for tonight. And if you want, if you have to pick between one of the two, I'd rather you have the notes for tonight just because it has, we're going to be going through uh, the plan of salvation, what it means to share, and I want to make sure you have these, uh, the, the form of it at least. I'm going to be giving you some recommendations, uh, not the least of which is, of course, we live in a tech, technology age. Everybody bring their phone tonight. Do you have a phone with you? Isn't that weird? Isn't that weird? So I started ministry 28 years ago, and how many people carried a phone to church? Zero. Most... How many people owned a phone in that church? Zero. I didn't get a phone, a cell, until I came to this church 20 years ago, but I was in that previous church 28 years ago. So things have changed. Anyway, I'm going to be showing you tonight a couple of different, one, one in particular, an app that's really great. How do I share my faith? Well, this, you've always, almost always got your phone, or they have their phone, and you can just go straight to the app, and it, it just, it, it walks you right through. It'll train you itself. It kind of teaches you how to share, and so we're going to be looking at that. Also, a great age of technology, part of that is uh, not good, because obviously the devil uses technology, but uh, the, the technology, nothing, we should give nothing over to the devil. We should always uh, realize that God can use uh, this stuff just as well, and of course technology is a great way to reach people, and we're doing that uh, probably better than we ever have as far as the, the church is concerned, which is awesome. We've seen how uh, during COVID, Although our attendance was down, in fact, to zero in, in person church, our attendance went up to five, six hundred on any given Sunday during the week because people were watching our services, and it's, it's continued along those lines. So really, what's our point here? Is our point so that we can come together and all look at each other and say, yeah, we're in church, or is our point to reach people? So I think it's great if we can do all of it, and we're doing that, and so I'm excited about that. So tonight we're going to be several places. We're going to be in the book of Nehemiah first. You can turn to Nehemiah chapter 1. And uh, we're going to start there in just a second. And while you're headed there, let's, let's pause for a second and let's pray. Again, I want to say a super big thanks to, to, to the Langners, Joe and Lynn Langner. They're the ones who fried up this fish. Uh, Tom and Joe all caught all these fish over the past, how long, Tom? A couple months? All summer? month and a half, something like that. 15 different species, I believe. Something like that. So you had uh, almost everything that's edible in the bay. If you ate two or three plates, which is what I did, you probably had one of those things. So you can say, no, I've eaten that, even though if you don't even know what it is, you probably have. Because if it's edible, they kept it. And there's some of the stuff that was not so edible that they kept anyway. They had some eel out there that I ate that I thought was really good. I don't know if anybody got the eel, but it was actually pretty good. Had a few bones in it, but it was good. So Joey, Joey, who's not in here, is my test case because he's from Minnesota and he's of Polish descent and he will eat anything. So I tell Joey, it's good to eat. And so he tries it. He's eating hardhead, skipjack, eel, scorpion fish, mother-in-law fish. If you don't know what a mother-in-law fish is, when you see it, you'll know why we call it that. <laughs> All right. Now, I, I said we were going to pray and so that's what we're going to do. So, but anyway, big thanks to them, and if you see them, when you see them, be sure to tell them thanks, because they, they're the ones been over backwards. Thanks to Angela and, and her uh, committee also that served us tonight as well. So let's pray, and we're going to start our time together. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that uh, we have a church, we have a place where people can come together and worship you, where people can come together and find, find people like-minded who love you and who love the scriptures, and... Um, who want to follow you, God, and we have to confess, even though we want to, we may not be doing it. We may not be doing it right, Lord, so we're coming together, part of our coming together is so that we can be corrected, Lord, and we need, we need that constantly. I need that. Constantly need to be reined in from the directions that I head and put in the direction I'm supposed to go. So, Lord, we're trusting you because you're our shepherd and because you're leading us, Lord, and we're trusting you and we're your sheep, and so we submit ourselves to that, and we ask you, God, your blessings over our time together. We pray especially as we look at uh, sharing our faith, Lord, we just ask that the burden of that necessity, of that call, 
would fall on us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we started last time looking, or we ended last time, looking at what is called the 4x4 challenge, and there it is, not on the screen, because I'm, I'm not up here, Jeff, and I'm not up there. So we were, but what happened to us? They rolled off. The 4x4 challenge is, well, 4x4, four people that you will identify as either one lost or two unchurched, and we don't know whether the person that doesn't come to church, whether they're lost or not. We can't make those kind of calls. But if they're not coming to church, they're not involved in a fellowship, and it's possible they're not saved. And so we're interested in, we're interested in reaching them for Christ. The 4x4 four four challenge is to identify at least four people. Did you do that this week? Did you come up with four? Maybe you couldn't come up with four. Maybe you're like me. I came up with around 10 people. I'm, I'm plugged in. I'm all good. I'm 100% here. You're just not on. Yeah. So what's going on? We're on the wrong channel. Wrong channel back there, apparently. So the 4x4 four four challenge is identifying at least four people that, you're, that you will commit to pray for at least four times a week. Now, me, I can't do four times a week. I've got to do every day or I can't, or it might as well not be any day because it's just got to be every day for me. I'm just that way. It's got to be on my prayer list. That I will pray these names, pray for these guys. In my case, it's guys. There we go. 4x4 four four challenge, four lost people. Again, we don't know if they're lost or not. We just know they're not in church. So you're trying to reach them. And maybe that you get through halfway through a gospel presentation and says, yeah, I already accepted Jesus. I already know. Well, then why aren't you in church then? Come on. We've got a great church. Come on. Come on. We, 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 God's called us not to make decisions, but to make disciples. Remember that. So I'm, I'm, we're talking about witnessing. We're talking about sharing our faith. But our goal isn't just to say, okay, now he's accepted Jesus. Let's move on. No, he's accepted Jesus. Let me take him under my wing. Let me disciple him or let me get him to a place where he can be discipled and uh, begin this process so that he, I can turn him into me which hopefully I'm following Christ. So first of all, identify them. Secondly, intercede for them. And that's where I want us to stop here for just a second and consider what it means to intercede. A great intercessory prayer, one of the best that I can, that I can think of, is the prayer that Nehemiah makes here as an introduction to his book. Nehemiah is, realizes that um, he receives a bad report about his home, about Jerusalem, and about the conditions of the city. And he knows that without walls and without gates, it's indefensible. There's no way to stop raiders and marauders. And so he is so burdened for, for his people and for his city and for the name of his God. He prays this intercessory prayer. And I want us to consider uh, where, what, what, what he says here. Nehemiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Kislev in the 20th year while I was in Susa, the capital. That's all the way over in Iraq. Iran, I'm sorry. Way over there. And Han and I, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came and asked, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. He had not gone back. How are they doing over there? He said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity were in great distress and reproach, and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Notice this reaction. Now it came about when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. The first, the first thing that matters about intercession, and one of the things that intercession does for us, is it comes from the heart. It comes from brokenness. I don't reach people if I'm not broken about people. Just the facts. Jesus, it says in, in about the same city that Jesus looked over to Jerusalem and he wept over it. Why? Because he knew their condition. We live in a world with lost people, people who, if they die today, go to hell. Does it bother us? And if it doesn't bother us, that should bother us. Something's not right. Because the Spirit of Christ doesn't live like that, doesn't act like that. Am I, am, so it begs the question, am I really giving myself over to the Spirit of God in my life? Is, am I really interceding? Am I really listening to the heart of Christ? So, number one... Intercession comes from the heart. It comes from brokenness. Real intercession comes from brokenness. I don't really pray hard about something that doesn't bother me. It's just the facts. So, so first of all, I'm identifying these people so that not because God doesn't know who they are, because apparently I'm not that on my radar. I need to see them as people who need Christ. I need to see them as people who need to follow Christ. 
And so I need to intercede for them. And asking, a part of that intercession is asking God to change my heart. Help me, God, to see them as you do. So he prays and fasts, it says. In verse 5, here he starts his prayer. I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great awesome God who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. So first of all, notice uh, intercessory prayer, number one, comes from brokenness. Number two, is based on the character of God. Because I know that you're faithful, God. Because I know that you're a God who honors your covenant. Because I know that you're a God who forgives. It's the same kind of prayer that we need to be praying for these people. Because I know that it's your heart, God, that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. I therefore pray for this person, this, these people. It comes from a heart of repentance. Calling them, calling them repentance. It comes from a, from a heart that loves them, is cry, cries out to God, and recognizes uh, the character of God. And then the third thing, it claims God's promises. Look at verses 8 and 9. Remember the word which thou didst command thy servant Moses, saying, If you are faith, unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote parts of heaven, I will gather them from there and will bring them to the place where I have placed and, and pla chosen my name, uh, chosen to cause my name to dwell. So what is he doing? He's reminding the God of his own promises. Does that kind of feel weird? Say, God, wait a minute, you promised a little, little presumptiveness. Now, first of all, if you're trying to hold God down for something he never said, that is presumptive. But God doesn't mind at all for you to hold him down for something that he did say. Doesn't bother a person of integrity, who I would suggest to you God definitely is, for you to say, you, you need to keep your promise. Does, the, the person that that bothers is a person that didn't intend to keep it. What? I don't know what you're talking about. You're offended because you really didn't have any intentions to carry through with it. God's never offended by you saying, please, God, do what you say. Do what you said you would do. So, so for instance, uh, Romans 10, 13, right? Here, oh, here it is. Romans 10, 13, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord God, you promised. I, I pray for my friend. I pray for my neighbor. I pray for my relative. That they would call on you. You promised that you would save them if they would. That's a very acceptable prayer. God loves the prayers like that because he's seeing your heart. And believe me, that's heart, the heart of God. You're not asking him to do anything that he's not totally excited about. Claims the promises of God. And then a the final thing, it's very specific. Look down at verse 11. O oh Lord, I beseech thee. Notice how very specific he is. So he's not just saying, hey, Lord, help those people over in Jerusalem. Fix the wall. Not, it's not a bad prayer. But notice he's very specific here. I beseech thee, may thine ear be attentive to, the, attentive to the prayers of thy servant and the prayer of thy servant who delight to revere thy name and make thy servant successful today. He's talking about himself. Grant him compassion before this man. He was going in. He's the cupbearer to the king. He's going in to the king to ask the king permission of leave of absence to go all the way over to Jerusalem, 1,000 miles more away, to oversee the project. Basically, he's, he's going to have himself appointed as governor, regional governor, over the city and area of Jerusalem, and with the authority of the king and the backing, the finances of the king, to come in there and actually build the walls. So that's a big statement. So the king... It, so what, what motivation does the king have to do that? This is a guy who serves in his court. A cupbearer to the king is the guy who sips the wine before the king does so that nobody poisons the king. So if he sips the wine, you count to ten, he doesn't fall over dead, then it's fine to drink the wine. Does that make sense? So Nehemiah is one of your most trusted people. You don't put just anybody in that job. I mean, this is a guy who's willing to die for you, and this is a guy who you know who will die for you. Because, because and so you trust him that much. How is it possible that this king is going to let him go? This is a great... This is a person you want to keep close to you. So he says, I, I need God very specific things. I need you to grant me favor in the eyes of this king so that he will let me go and let me help my people. Very specific request. So when I'm praying for someone who does not know Christ, what am I asking for? I'm asking for opportunities for me to be able to speak to him and for him to be receptive. Not just, not that it's bad, but it's not very specific. 
help him come to know Jesus. All right, that's great. What about you leading him to Jesus? That's a much more specific prayer. Give me opportunity to speak to them. So, so back, to our, back to our four by four. So number one, number one, write down the four people that you're willing, or more, that you're willing to pray for. Pray for them four times a week. Number, 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 that's number two. Number three, invite them. Be intentional to engage them. Actually get involved in their lives. It, it takes time. It takes energy. Uh, invest in them. In most cases, they have a trust issue, and they typically are going to trust you before they'll ever trust your God. So it takes time. It takes energy and effort. It means you've got to get your hands dirty. Sometimes we run in the circles of Christian circles, and we have no, almost no contact with the lost world, people who don't know Jesus. I'm, I'm assuming all of you do. So, so you people, not that you don't deserve my time, but there's a world out there that needs my time as well. There's a world that needs you involved in their lives. Invest in their lives. And then we ended last time ultimately by challenging you to memorize Matthew 9, verses 36 and 38. Did you do that? If you haven't, you need to do it. Because here, notice, notice again, it's sort of the same plot of, of the prayer and the mindset of Nehemiah and what we just talked about. What is intercession? Seeing the crowds, it says, Jesus felt compassion for them. So how am I seeing the crowds and not feeling compassion? How can I say I'm following Jesus? Begs the question, doesn't it? Begs the question. Seeing the crowd, he, Jesus, felt compassion for them because they were distressed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd. Maybe then part of your intercessory prayer is, God, help me to see these people like you do. Part of my problem is that the people just bother. I don't know. I'm getting more, as older I'm getting, the crotchety I get. People just bother me. Kind of like, well, you know, go over there and be that by yourself. And Jesus, if there was anybody that should have been crusted over, anybody that should have had an attitude, should have been Jesus. He did not. He did not. I don't have a right because I'm a sinner just like they are, a rescued sinner, saved sinner. Still a sinner. I don't have any business whatsoever being all that. So I need to pray, first of all, that my heart would change, but also that, so that I could see the people and, and feel the same way Jesus did, because they were distressed and downcast, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. It's us. Therefore, plead, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his field. Pick a translation. I write, this is New American Standard. NIV is not bad. ESV is not bad. And memorize it word for word. Let it be something that rests on your heart. Again, we hide God's word in our heart so that we will not sin against God. It is a sin to not be sharing. It is. Not just something that you can check out of. It's something that Jesus has commanded us to do. Again, it begs the question. If Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men, but you're not fishing. It's a great night to say that, by the way. We just, everybody about to fall asleep yet? Yeah. There's... Joe, Joe and Lynn, okay, I've been talking about y'all tonight. Yay. Wave. Hi. I, I, I sold you out, Joe. I said, you know, Polish descent, but he's from Minnesota. He eats anything. So Tom and I get him to eat. I just tell him, oh, eat that, Joey. It's good. And so he does. And actually, the eel was really good. I thought it was exceptional. So I didn't tell you to eat that, though, did I? Or did I? Yeah. You ought to try it. I did. But I think you ate eel from Minnesota, too, didn't you? So you weren't afraid of that. Saltwater eel, though. Anyway. So, so memorize our verse, Matthew 9, verses 36 through 38. We have such a great privilege of watching God work through us. And that's what, 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 is, it, what is sharing our faith? Seeing God do a miracle through you. Or no, you want to see, well, if, if I could just say, snap, snap my fingers and say, God's going to give you a miracle working ability, would you want that? It's a lot of responsibility, but... Small change miracles is resurrecting somebody from the dead, curing cancer. That small change, how do I know that? Because they're going to die again anyway. So you only fix them for a time. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, right? He died again. I, that's, I, I feel sorry for Lazarus. Every time I come across this story, I'm thinking, man, couldn't these people get a message some other way? I died once, and then here three or four years later, i got to die again. The, the real miracle is seeing someone converted from death spiritually to life that is the bigger miracle god has called us to be miracle workers working god's miracle of salvation through us and we don't have an option in that like i said we have a command to go so it's not an option we've been commanded 
He didn't say, if you can, give it a shot. He doesn't say that. He says, go. So we're either obeying it or we're living in disobedience. There's only two kinds of Christians. Ones that talk about lost people and the others that talk to lost people. Our goal is to talk to them. They need us. God is not sending his angels. He's not sending anyone else to reach the lost. And, and we won't share our faith until we realize who we're surrendered to. Either I'm surrendered to my own life and the things I want to do, or I'm surrendered to Jesus and the things that he wants to do. But there can't be both. If I'm going to follow Jesus, I can no longer follow Bill. Got to give up on Bill. Bill's not done me any good anyway. So a couple of things to deal with here, if you look at your notes there. First of all, fear of rejection. We have a problem with that when we think about witnessing. One of our problems is, is that fear. John 6, 44. No one, notice how Jesus says this, takes all the burden off of you. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So it's not about Bill. It's not about Les. It's not about Mark. It's not about you. It's about the work of God. You're, you're just a, in the toolbox of God, you're the hammer. And I know your wife says you're like a bag of hammers, but it's the same. Of, of, what, of what benefit, of what skill, what skill does a hammer have to possess to drive a nail? Zero. It doesn't have any skills. It's the one that grasps the hammer. So you may be as dumb as a bag of hammers, but still, God can use you. Do you believe that? So it's about God. It's not about you. So, so hear me on this. Uh, this is the one area of the Christian life that you cannot fail, other, other than failing to do it. But if you forge ahead in this, you cannot fail in it. Because you don't do it. It is God. We need to be free from the feeling like we cause someone to be saved. When, when they reject this, it's not rejecting us. They're rejecting God. They're rejecting the message of the movement of God. So it's not about me. It, it's the one area, like I said, in the Christian life where I really can't fail. We can't mess this up. It, it, it's it's if, if we share stupidly or tactlessly or with poor timing, God can use that. Oh, I've got to be of the right heart and the right spirit because, and, and you know, um, it, it's better if you are. But I've known people who shared the Christ for the wrong motives. I've known people who came to Christ underneath the ministry of a person I would call a false teacher. Why? Because God, if the message, listen, even though that guy is a kook, but he occasionally says you have to trust Jesus as your Savior, and someone comes to Christ under that ministry, guess what? God uses that. And by the way, it's not me just thinking that. Here's Philippians. Look at what Paul says. This is astounding. Philippians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. He's in prison. And there are some people who are trying to help him. There's some people who are trying to make it hard for him. And the way they're making it hard for Paul is taking Paul's message into public and sharing it with people. So they're, they're just trying to say, and then, and then when a ruckus arises over that because the Romans were very pagan and they didn't want people talking about Christ, they say, well, Paul told us to come and say this, hoping to get Paul in trouble, possibly get Paul killed. Notice Paul's opinion about this. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. So which one would you rather? I would hope you do it from goodwill. Notice what he says. The former preached Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter are out of love, knowing that I'm appointed uh, for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice. Yes, he says, I will rejoice. So totally wrong motives. They share the truth. Paul says, why should that bother me? The truth is the truth. People either even under false teaching. So, so I'm telling you, if these Yahoos can't mess it up, you can't mess it up with the right intentions. You cannot. It's not something you can fail at. But one of the greatest stories that I can think of to, to demonstrate this is the story of Jonah. Anybody like the book of Jonah? It's a great book because you can get through it in one sitting. Just four chapters, very short. Jonah is the story of a guy who did not want to share his faith. In fact, got very mad, ran off, and this was his problem because he knew, as he says, because he knew that God is kind and forgiving and gracious. And so out of fear that God would act like he normally does out of kindness and grace and mercy, 
he, he so badly wanted the Ninevites that for God to just wipe them all out that he gets on a boat and goes and leaves the other direction because he's afraid that if he preaches to these people that they will be converted. And the worst thing for Jonah is to go to heaven and have some of these Ninevites there with him. He hated them. He hated them that much. Of course, you know the story. God pulls the boat over. Basically, they throw him in the water. He gets swallowed by a big fish. He gets thrown up on the beach. He at least obeys God, but not, not willingly. He goes and preaches. Here's, the, here's, the, um, here's to the chagrin of every preacher out there who wants to preach a 45-minute sermon. He preaches a one-sentence sermon. One sentence. Yea, 40 days, and God's judgment will fall upon the city unless you repent. He just did that. He walked through the city streets. Now, where's your, where's your three points? Where's your illustration? Where's the joke in the middle to keep people awake? I'm just asking these questions. As a preacher, I have to ask these questions in defense of my job. Where is this? One sentence sermon goes through this whole completely pagan city. I mean, these are the worst pagans. They're horrible. He had a good reason. If there's a reason to hate, he had a good reason to. And the whole city repented in sackcloth and ashes. And there was nobody madder about it than Jonah. Talk about a guy who had the wrong motives. Had no heart for them. No love for them. Got very mad. Spends the rest of the book after they repent. Mad at God. That God would save them. Mad that he's going to get to heaven. He's got to live with some of these creepy people. Mad, mad, mad. And guess what? Doesn't matter. God takes the message from the messenger and he reaches them. So, can you be better than Jonah? Can you have an attitude better than Jonah? If Jonah couldn't fail, you cannot fail. Again, it's the work of God. It's not you. There's no, there's no numbers here. There's no, I, I, I'm, a better, I'm better than Joe. Joe's better than me. I'm better than Jonah or whatever. No, it's God working through us. You're on a hammer. God is working through the hammers that have, been given, that, that have been put into his hands. So number one, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of uh, the fear of rejection. Number two, the other, other fear is you fear you don't know enough. It's an ex- excellent, again, uh, excellent illustration. It's interesting. The person who's newly saved never has that problem. The person who newly comes to Christ, you have to rein them in because they want to go tell their whole family. They don't know nothing. Wait a minute. I've got a doctor degree. Let me tell you how to come to tell people how to come to Jesus. They don't need my information. They just need to go share. And they do. They don't have any kind of restrictions in them saying, maybe I don't know enough. The people that start worrying about maybe they don't know enough is when we start learning a lot of stuff. And there's, we should learn. But somehow we get this idea that it's, it's what we know that makes a difference, and it's not. It's not us. It's God. It's God working through us. It is. So it's something that we cannot mess up. The Bible doesn't require ability. It requires obedience. Obedience. Will you be obedient? Ability. God's, God can handle ability. God can do anything. God can take Moses, who couldn't, couldn't finish a sentence, and use him to, to, to deliver all of Israel from, from Egypt and uh, destroy the mightiest nation of the world at that time. He can do that. No, he's not limited at all. So God wants to take his spirit, pour it through our lives, so that despite our shortcomings, his power is revealed. That's what happens in the witness encounter. Are you willing to do that? Starts with coming up with people. Ends with you sharing. In the middle, you pray. Pray for yourself. Pray for them. Again, will you take that commitment? So let's, let's look at some, some things here, just some steps. Like I said, I wanted to spend some time training, even though I've told you basically you don't need training. You just need to have confidence that God's going to use you. And then now I'm going to turn around and train you. It's not that... Training is bad. It's just that don't, don't think because I'm now trained, I'm now better at sharing my faith. Don't think that. A person with a heart for God, who know, first of all, who is saved, if you know enough to be saved, you know enough to share, you know enough to share with somebody how to be saved. Confident of that. But, but with, maybe with a little training, we can get just a little bit better, a little bit more confident, and we can move forward with, with what God has for us. So let's look at a couple of things here. They're there on your sheet. The first, the first thing I've, I've headlined there is the word approach, the approach. How do you approach someone? How do you say, hey, can I talk to you about Jesus? Sometimes, sometimes people do that. 
Sometimes that's the thing that turns people off. So, so how do I get into a conversation with people about Jesus? Well, there's lots of ways to start off. The, the, way, the way this starts off, and by the way, this is from out of a book called Sharing Jesus Without Fear. I want to make sure I give credit to this guy, but I, would, I know this guy, and he's not interested in any kind of credit. He just wants us to go out and share our faith. One, one of the ways he introduces, possibly ask the question, or something like this, do you have any kind of spiritual belief? You're just turning the subject from, I don't know, the A&M UT game to something spiritual. Uh, another way, there's, uh, from another ministry that I really love, and I'm going to bring some tracks next time of what this guy puts out, but he, one of the things that he does is he takes a, a penny, and I don't think you can do this anymore. This is from 20 years ago. But he takes a penny, and he has a machine. You know, when you go to the zoo, you can put a penny in a machine, you roll it through the thing, and it'll do your thumbnail if you let it, you know, kind of thing. It rolls out, and it has the picture of a draft, I don't know, an elephant or something like that. He's got, he bought a machine and had a machine built where he could roll a penny through, and it prints out the entire Ten Commandments. You'll see it? You want to try one? There's who wants one. I got a pocket full. These are, these are great. Who wants? Well, way over there, Joe. It's behind you. I can't throw that far. I got a bad arm. Whoa. Get him groveling down the middle. Here we go. There's one. Way down there. There it goes. Y'all, you'll find them. So, so, so he prints out, of all the things he prints out, he prints out the Ten Commandments, and he uses them as little pennies. And like say, he say, for instance, I'll, I'll be, he, he, this guy that does this is just this fabulous evangelist, real gift of evangelism, uh, goes and sits in a doctor's office, for instance, with five people in the, in, the, in the waiting room. He'll go and just, the guy next to him, the guy next to him, he'll just hand her one of these pennies. She'll say, oh, what's that? Oh, it's just a, it's a penny. It's got the Ten Commandments pressed on it. He says, by her reaction, I will know whether I can make the next step. If she says something to the effect of, oh, wow, that's really nice, thanks. He says, then I'll proceed with another question. If she's just like, oh, pfft, thanks, plops it in her purse, just like, you know, she's not open. And people aren't open, they aren't open. And by the way, let me hear, hear me on this. Nonetheless, that's a successful witnessing encounter because you took a shot. It's the fact that we're, it's, that's not a disobedience. Disobedience is, is the problem. Obedience is never an issue. So I've moved as far as it'll go. It's, that's it. The guy doesn't want to talk. Okay, great. Jesus dealt with people like that all the time. He moved right on. He didn't go back to them. Sometimes people are ready, sometimes there aren't. So these questions, like I said, this, that Ten Commandments opens the door. Uh, a question like, do you have any kind of spiritual beliefs? You can tell by the reaction. Do they really want to have a conversation along these lines? Or another question would be, to you, who is Jesus? Not a bad question. You can tell where they are on this. Where are they, you know, do they, is this some kind of wall raised up? Are they interested in a conversation? Are they open to this? Again, you're just trying to feel out, is God working in this person's life? This is also including the people that you're praying for. Or, you know, how, how, can I, how can I reach them? Do you think, here's another question, it kind of gets a little bit, do you think there's a heaven and hell? And the next question is effectively, which one do you plan to go to? 100% of the people are going to say heaven. Tell you right now, which gives you a leading. Notice the next question. If you believe, if what you believe were not true, would you want to know it? Very good question. It's a very good question. You don't have to say that exactly the way it's said, but something along these lines gets you in the process, gets you in a conversation with a person. Again, it enables you to evaluate are they ready? Like I said, some people aren't ready. Jesus, we saw this lady last time. By the way, he's talking talk about a person who's not ready to share their faith. Remember the woman at the well? She, she had just talked to Jesus and went back to her town, and she said something to the effect of, I think this could be the Messiah. That was her whole witnessing platform, and her whole town came to Jesus. Again, in the defense of all of us preachers, where's her three points? Where's her, where's her illustrations? Where's her personal, where's her personal uh, uh, illustration? Where's her, where's her joke in the middle? Keep everybody awake. Again, all my training out the window. This woman had no training whatsoever, and she goes, and the whole town gets saved. It tells us what the real work is. The real work is just being obedient. Have I tried? Are you trying? Obedience is what matters, not skills. Obedience. God does not require ability. He requires obedience. So if you, were, if you believe 
If what you believe were not true, would you want to know it? And that's where we start looking at the Scriptures. You, you can do, most, most of you are not going to be carrying a Bible in your hands. But you will almost all be carrying one of these. So I, I would recommend to you, and I want you to write this down. It's down at the bottom of the page, I believe, after, after the close there. Uh, one, of, one, of, one of the apps there says, share your faith app. The previous two I don't recommend. One of them is broken, and the bridge app also is, is not available. But these are just in my notes. The share your faith app is excellent. I know it is for the iOS, for the, for the iPhone, but I don't know about the Android. I'm pretty sure it's there. Uh, for the iOS, it was free. And it's just an app that takes you through a presentation of the gospel. It has the verses there. It, it gives a little illustration. It's really cool. It's really well done. Um, let me find it. There it is. Got this nice little graphics. I know you can't see it. I tried to get it on my computer, but it's only for, it's only for phones and, and iPads. It says, us and God. You swipe it. Swipe it. Brings this wall down. It shows the division between us. It tells us what the division is. Here's you trying to get across to God. Here's the fact that because we've sinned, it's got a thing down at the bottom. You hit the Bible. It brings up verses that talk about that. For everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're going to see that one in just a second. Romans 3.23. So, so this is a great prop, if you will. So, so if what you believe was not true, would you want to know it? Yeah. Let me show you something. Have them read the verses. Ask them the question, what does this mean to you? And then explain it. Have them read it, though. How, can't you see how Everyone is sin and follow short of the glory. Let's, let's go, by the way. Let's, let's take a look at some of these verses. In fact, all, all these verses together. Romans 3.23, first of all. How do I share my faith? Again, faith comes through hearing, and hearing through the Word of God. Do I have to have all these verses memorized? No, I do not. Can, it, can there be just one verse that I know that, that, I can, that I can memorize and lead someone to Christ. Yes, there is. I'm going to show you that one in just a second. Romans 3.23, though, is a great place to start because here's, here's, here's the problem that I've seen in most places, most cases, sharing people, sharing with people about Christ. Most people, like I said, already think they're going to heaven. I'm American. I'm a Christian. Well, okay, you're, you know, you're um, sleep with a different person every week, and you're, uh, I don't know, in the honky-tonks all the time, and you're uh, doing a whole bunch of stuff that's outside of Jesus and watching pornography uh, in between, and, but you're a Christian. Okay, I mean, I, people can be, sinners can be saved, sinners, sinners sin, but it doesn't look like it. So, so start, the, the place to start, Romans 3.23, are you there? Notice the place, the place, the best place to start, in fact, the only place to start is to understand, as it says there, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. A person, listen, will not come to Jesus if they don't think they're a sinner. Most people don't think they are. They all say, I'm a sinner, but I'm not as bad as Les. You know, I mean, if they're letting Les in, then I'm surely going to get in. Well, Les is not getting in on his own merit. He's not. See, that's what they think. There's this hierarchy, you know, and I'm better than most. And I'm, I'm above average, so therefore I'm making it in. It's the 50% and below that aren't getting in. Where did they get that from? Well, not from the Bible. So you have to help them understand sin. Oh, by the way, that little Ten Commandments thing is a great. So this is a good way, a good conversation starter. So have you kept the Ten Commandments? Oh, yeah, pretty much. So, so let's go over. What, what about um, thou shalt not steal? Have you kept that one? Oh, yeah. No, I don't, I'm not a thief. Well, I didn't say you were a thief. I said, have you ever, it says thou shalt not steal. Have you ever stolen anything? Well, yeah, I mean, everybody's stolen something. I'm, I mean, not much. I'm, I'm not a thief. Well, how many, how many things do you have to steal to become a thief then? Do like 10, and then you reach a limit? Or does it have to be over a certain, you know, value? Does it have to be like grand larceny, you know, over, what is it, 200 bucks? I don't know what the, what the value, I haven't been a thief in a long time. But, it, you know, what, what is it? So, so understand, in our, and, and again, this is not what we're talking about, helping them understand. We're not talking about our standards. We're talking about God's standards. It says, thou shalt not steal. That's got a period at the end. Don't do it ever. So have you ever done that? Well, yeah, I've done that. Well, then what does that make you? Well, it makes you a thief. And ultimately makes you a sinner. And you can go from there. One of the, you really don't have to go through all the Ten Commandments. My favorite commandment is just simply the greatest commandment, which is what? Thou shalt what? Love 
the Lord their God, with all their heart, with all their soul, all that strength. There's no exceptions to that. But by the way, if you've made an exception to that, you're the breaker of the greatest commandment in all the Bible. That's not good. But you plan to go to heaven. So what's your plan? So help them understand their sin. The biggest lie, the biggest blindness the devil has, the pervading blindness that is upon our world today is they think they're, they're fine. I'm good. So we're not clamoring to come into our churches or to hear our gospels because they think they're fine. Oh, I'm a good person. I'm, I'm not a Muslim. I've heard that one. Like, well, I, I've met some Muslims actually who are better than you. They're pretty decent people. Friendly, honest. I, you know, try, try that argument with a, anybody from a Mormon background. I promise you. I promise you the Mormon is better than most, no offense, most of the people in this room. They keep their rules very good. They have a pride in that. I'm a good person. So, okay, but that's, you know, good is relative. Yeah, you're better than me, but you're better than Jesus. You're better than me, but you have broken the greatest commandment in all the Bible, and you plan to go to heaven. Wow, what's your, what's your, what's your plan with that? There has to be a solution. So you have to help them understand it from where God comes from, which is that we are all sinners. Romans 3.23, there you have it. So look at Romans 6.23. This is the verse, by the way, that can stand all by itself can be used by itself. You want to memorize just one of these. This is the one that can stand that way. Because it helps them understand what happens with their sin. The wages of sin is death. People understand a wage, don't they? So I work for you 10 hours. You owe me 10 hour pay. So if I've, if I've earned with my sin a wage and that wage is death, God owes me what? He owes me death. See, the world needs to hear that. Well, God would never throw a person like me in hell, oh, really? So he hung Jesus on the cross to pay for your sins. He didn't make an exception with his son, but he's not going gonna, gonna to make an exception with you? I'm sorry. That's just simply not true. The wages of sin is death, but here's, here's the good news. So I have the bad news. I start with the bad news, and then I go to the good news. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So I have to start with the bad news. So think of yourself as a doctor. And you're making a, you're making a, prog, a, a, what's the word? Diagnosis. Prognosis is afterwards, right? You're making a diagnosis. The, diagnos, the diagnostic is that they're sinners. How do you convince them of that? Come up with a way. Talk to them about sin. Help them understand the commandments. Talk to them about sin and, and what happens to a sinner. So, so I've now helped you understand the disease. And I would say to you very carefully, that the, the better they understand the disease, the more they'll accept the cure. In fact, you don't have to talk about the cure very much if they understand the disease. Most people are not coming for the cure, which is Jesus, because they don't believe they have it. They don't believe they're sick. They think they're fine. Well, I'm good. Yeah, Jesus is for the bad people, for Les and Mark and Tom and Joey and, you know, Bill. But I don't, you know, I don't need Jesus. I'm a good person. Jesus is a great example. You know, hang on the cross. I so appreciate that. But I'm going to be fine. I'm going to get to heaven, and me and the man upstairs are going to make a deal. Of course, they're totally wrong. They need to see that they're sinners. And sometimes that takes time. And, and also prayer. Again, the, the conviction of sin, the Scripture tells us very plainly, comes from the Holy Spirit. Not from Bill. Not from you. This is a total God-involved process. God brings conviction of sin through his Holy Spirit, conviction of righteousness, which is the next step. So the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. There's John 3, 3, which is that you must be born again. Uh, uh, John 14, 6 tells us that, let's go to John, by the way, we're, we're going to be there. And then go back to Romans. Again, even though I'm, I'm giving you sort of a plan, it's only sort of a plan. I, I don't want to set any kind of dogmatic, it has to go this way, in our heads. And some of us here are perfectionists. Anybody? You know, I follow a certain set of rules. And, and by the way, that's fine. It's, it's again, there, there's not a wrong way to do this. The only thing wrong is to not do it. So it comes out of your personality, and you dot every I and cross every T. Great. Do it that way. 
Don't try to do it like me. I'm going to do it like Bill does because that's, not, that's my natural. I'm not going to do it like you. You're not going to do it like me. And God honors both ways. John chapter 3, verse 3. This is Jesus speaking to, ne- speaking to Nicodemus. John chapter 3 is just great. It has just such, such jewels in it. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Of course, that's a, that's a huge theological, you know, what does it mean to be born again? Well, you can just simply say, uh, you know, that's pretty serious, though, don't you think? It's not like, oh, I've got to go to a church. I've got to be a good person. No, this is, this is a conversion, a change. So it's something that only God can do. So, so it gets in the place to say, wow, I, how, how does this happen? And Jesus tells us over here in John 14, 6. Yes, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. So, so I have this about bringing them to an understanding. Do you have to use all these verses? No, you do not. Uh, but these are just ones that help, help you see how, how can they understand that Jesus is it. And, and you've got to get to that. Like I said, Romans 6.23 stands by itself because it says, I'm, you know, for the wage of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So that says it all, really. You can use these other verses to augment it. Uh, but it really, it, sa- it says it all. And then, of course, you have how, uh, the, if you will, the follow through. How, what, how do they, so how do I do this? What's the practical? So I, so I understand that I'm a sinner and that I, that I need my sins to be dealt with and that I want Jesus to forgive my sins. What do I do? Well, look at Romans 10. So grateful for Baptist upbringing. And, um, and I know there's, there's lots of good churches and lots of good people in churches, and there's lots of, by the way, bad Baptist churches as well. So I wish I could recommend every Baptist church to you, but I'm so grateful for the church I was raised in. The Baptists, when I was growing up, Southern Baptists in particular, were very big on sharing your faith. I mean, that was just, you did it, which is, by the way, correct. And they taught us, we had a thing called RAs and GAs, Royal Ambassadors. We were ambassadors for Christ, right? GAs, girls, girls in action is what it stood for, but girls also who are ambassadors. And uh, they taught us in there what was called the Roman Road. And so these verses that I'm saying to you, by the way, I can quote them all in King James. That's how long ago I learned them because I haven't read King. I've been in the King James since I was in elementary school. But I can quote them all in King James and quote different verses that I know. I can quote them in different versions and it tells you what, at what time in my life I learned them. So I went from the King James to the NIV and the NIV to the NAS since I've been preaching as a pastor. So, anyway, Romans 10. Tells us several things. Number one, we saw this one, verse 13. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. His name is Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Back up to verse 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead... You shall be saved. Like I said, some people say, well, it can't be that simple. It can be. He says it. It's his word. You can take him on it. With the heart a man believes in resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses and is saved. Again, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed, it says in verse 11. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, verse 13, shall be saved. Revelation 3.20 there uh, we won't look at that one, but that's where Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. In other words, Jesus is waiting for us to make a decision. You should expect him to be. Because why? He hung on the cross, paid for all the sins of the world, died, resurrected, went to heaven, is sitting in heaven waiting for what? For the ministry of the church. For, to, for us to do our job. He's waiting for us. Of course, God knows everybody who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. But I, he hasn't brought me in on that. I don't know if he's brought you in on that. I don't know who they are. I don't, I don't know the number. There's got to be a number. I don't know what that number is. But I have a job. And my job is not to save anybody, but it's to tell the world the truth. And it's to involve myself in the lives of lost people where I can get an opportunity to, to be obedient to what God has called me to do. Again, God's not called me because of my ability. He's not called me for ability. He's called me to be obedient to him. And so here's some closing questions that you can speak to this person that you've been praying for and praying for an opportunity to witness to. So are you a sinner? Are you convinced that you are? Like I said, most of the time, if they don't think they are, 
they won't accept Jesus. And so you still need to pray for them. You still need to work for them. Do you want forgiveness of your sins? So you got the disease. Do you want to be healed? Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you and rose again? Are you willing to surrender yourself to Christ? We've seen these verses here that, that say similar things. Are you ready to invite Jesus into your heart, into your life? So these are clo closing questions. How do I get a person to the place? And sometimes they'll say, you know, I'm not ready to do that. And you know what? They're not ready. And I don't, you know, as they say, bash them over the head with your Bible. Now, I appreciate your heart, first of all, that you care enough for them that you want them to be saved, but this is not about you getting a notch on your Bible or whatever. It's about them in a process. And as we saw, as we saw talked about last time, and for many of us here, we know that our coming to Christ was a process. I didn't come to Christ the first time I heard about it. I came forward in a church and was baptized in a church before I ever believed in Jesus. I came forward because my brother did. And we were twins, and of course we did everything together. And it's like, well, he's trusting Jesus. I guess i got to go up there and pray and trust Jesus. I don't know. That's not a right motive. It was about a year later that I actually, and I don't know, like I said, how many times that I heard about trusting Jesus in that great Baptist church I grew up in, hundreds of times. So somewhere in there, we have others of you in here who, have, who heard about Jesus, rejected Jesus, others who didn't know who Jesus was, some of you who, who just, God took you through a lot of different things. I mean, there's just so many different ways that people come, and there's so many players in your lives. And there's some of those players who I'd be willing to bet if you could find them, they, they think you're in hell right now. <laughs> some of you here. Oh, no. Tom, you know, sorry, Tom. Tom, oh, no, somebody up in Ohio. Oh, no, Tom's in hell right now. We know for sure he is because there's just no way. That, that man was terrible. And he was probably. Sorry, Tom. And, you know, they would have counted him off, you know. But here's Tom. He's been a deacon in the church now for, I don't know, a long time. Too long, right, Tom? Not long enough. For catching fish for fellowship. It's great. But, but again, people didn't, they were not able to see the impact that, that they had, but it took, took a lot. All we, of course, we owe a lot to D.D. We're so grateful. Thank you for not killing him. <laughs> that, that you allowed him to live this long. And, you know, because these, but these people that influenced us, and so I don't have to be the closer, if you will to reap the rewards. These people who were, who were faithful to sow into our lives are all going to be rewarded for what they did. And so I have to be confident that God's going to use whatever opportunity and whatever energy, uh, the, what, however far I can go in this conversation with this person. And, and maybe, maybe today's not a good day. Maybe tomorrow is. Maybe they're just like, you know, I'm just going to have to chew on this for a while. Let them chew on it. It's okay. There is a time limit, yes. They're alive when it's over. But you have, to, you have to trust the work of God. It's not your work. I just, if I had said it right, I had people on a regular time throughout my ministry, Pastor, if I just had you with me, they would have trusted Jesus. It's like, no, they wouldn't. Uh, it's the work of God in their life. And I maybe could explain some of their questions. I don't know. But there are a lot of questions I don't have answers for. And so I, I'm more of a let's let God work on them. And let's come back to them. Again, many times people don't trust God until they trust you. So they see, no, she's a great lady. And there's something about her. And, and I want that. So maybe I will listen to her. And, and there's others who, who will push you away, and sometimes forever. And that's just the facts. It's a sad facts, but it is. So, 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 so as slowly as it took, or as fast as it took for God to work on us, we need to have the same kind of patience uh, with these people. So I want to give you that. The next time we come together, we're going to talk a little bit more about sharing our faith and, and add a few things in there. I want, also want to add next time uh, tracks. And again, like this Bible app is, is sort of like a track. I hold it up and I take you through the plan of salvation. But what I'm really talking about is not so much this because, and to me, why do I need to carry around pieces of paper if I've got a phone? But there are pieces of paper, tracks, and other things you know, sort of like these, these Ten Commandments on a, on a penny, which can stand all by themselves. They can be left in places. Not a reason to litter the ground, but they can be left. They stand alone. We have some track, tracks out here in the hall from, from Chick Organization out of California. They're good stand-alone tracks. I'm going to bring some examples of some of these things that you can order to have with you. Again, we're supposed to be witnesses. So sometimes, if I'm going to a restaurant, for instance, and I sit down, and I have a waitress there, and all I can do is say, hey, can I pray for you? Hey, my friend and I, we're going to pray together. Can we, can we pray for you? 
and that's all the ministry that I have with her or with him. Uh, maybe I can leave a track and say, hey, can I give you this? Would you be willing to read this? And some of these tracks are really good. They stand alone. They, have, they, they present the gospel very well. They're very interesting. Uh, some of them have uh, some very interesting ways of, of coming across and helping you think. Again, the, the whole work is just me standing constantly in prayer saying, God, how can I possibly be, be used to, to do the work that you call me to do? How can, I, how can I reach a world? If I'm it, if we are all the evangelists that the world has, Island Baptist Church, we're the only church, not just on, uh, in, in the region of South Padre Island, we're the only church in the entire Americas or the whole world, what would we be doing today? You know, we, we'd be, we need to be divvying up our assignments. You go over there, and you go here, and you go across, and you learn how to speak Spanish and cross the river, and you go up north, and you go west, and you get on a boat and go over to China. We've got to reach the world. So our, our, the burden of the world needs to be upon us. We can't just sit back and say, oh, well, others are going. Oh, well, there's other ministries out there. What about you? What about me? I'm not answering for them. I'm going to answer for myself. We have a great responsibility. So we're going to stop right there. Do you have any questions? Did you get the app? Yeah. Some of you look for it? Yeah. Was, it on, was it on Android? Yeah. Okay. The iOS version, like I said, at the bottom, it's got the Bible. It's got a whole training thing. If you want to learn how to present your faith, it's got settings, training video about. It does you a little tour. It just says start. It just starts. People, you know, again, it's it, in our world anymore. If I want to show you my phone, everybody's like, oh, yeah, let me see. It's like, okay, well, here, let's take a look. There it is. Let's talk about you and God. And uh, I think that's great. I think it's a good thing. So let's, let's call it to a close. Appreciate your time. Again, appreciate Joey and the Langers for all that they did and all the fish. What's the, what's the situation with our fish? Do we have a bunch left over? Does people get enough? Do we have stuff? What are we... If we leave a bunch of fish in this place, and when my secretary gets here tomorrow, she's going to be like, what is that smell? <laughs> so uh, we need, if there's stuff left over, we just need to divvy it out, I guess, right? Or is it divvied already? Is it already divvied? Okay, good. Super good. So thanks for your time. And uh, again, four people, at least, who you will pray for four times a week, at least, who you will intercede for, asking God to work on their lives, asking for an opportunity to speak to them, involving yourself with them, bringing them to Christ, bringing them to church, bringing them to, to a place where you can have a conversation. Let's pray together. God, I thank you so much for the opportunity we have to serve you. And I pray for the burden of the ministry that it would fall upon us. Help us to have eyes that see. And like I said, God, I have a tendency to just get tired of people and, and um, leave them alone because it just they're too much trouble. And you never did that. You never tired. You never stop reaching out. You never stop speaking. God, help us to be the same kind of people. Give us your spirit, God. Amen. Fill us with your spirit so we have your same attitude. We have the same heart. We see the world the way you see it, and not with jaded eyes, not with, not with judgmental eyes, with eyes of deep concern, as we learned in our passages we're memorizing, Lord, that you looked upon them and you, with compassion. You felt compassion for them. For they were uh, distressed and dejected like, like sheep without a shepherd. God, help us to see them the way you see them. Thank you, God, for this time. Thank you for our, our time of fellowship also. We pray your blessings over all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.